Do you have trust issues? Now, I'm not talking about whether you can't have difficulty trusting people. I'm talking about whether we, you have difficulty trusting God. Do you struggle to trust God when things get difficult in life? Do you struggle to trust him in regard to the future as you look at our country and maybe you're worried of what's going to happen? Do you struggle to trust him in that? Maybe it's in your family or maybe some, you look at your children and uh, there's issues in your family and you, do you struggle to trust God then? And you could think of maybe a job or many areas of your life. Do you struggle to trust in God in those areas? And do you have a tendency, instead of seeking God's help and, and seeking him and trusting him, do you have a tendency to, to trust in people? Maybe it's you turning to a friend or turning to a spouse or maybe you trusting in a politician or trusting in someone else that you know rather than in God. Do you struggle with that? I think all of us here could say we all struggle. We, we all lack faith. We all struggle struggle to trust God. We all have a tendency to put our hope in people, to look to them for help, to look to them for hope, to look to them for comfort and joy. And what do we do? How do we deal with the fact that we struggle sometimes with trusting God? What is the remedy for a lack of trust in our Father in heaven? What solution does Scripture give for that problem? Well, the text that we're going to look at today, Psalm 146, gives us the remedy for our lack of trust in God. And the remedy is this. It's praise. It's worship. That may not be what you thought right away as you thought about your lack of trust in God, but really the, the solution to your problem of, of, tr- of, la- of a lack of trust in God is to praise God. And our psalm will show us how to do that. And so, as we've kind of indicated, our psalm here is a psalm of praise. And it comes within a context. The context is found in in Psalm 146 to 150. And those psalms are all, they're called the final halal. They're the the last section of our psalter. And they have what, what they have in common is that they both begin and end with praise the Lord or, or praise Yah or hallelujah as we know it better. And all of these psalms really are about praising God. They're bursting with praise and worship to Yahweh, to our God. And as we see, look at our psalm, Psalm 146, we're going to see this. We're also going to see the the, the, the similar theme of, of tr- trusting God as well. And we're going to see how trusting, praising God is really the, what fortifies our trusting in God. And so if you look at, you'll notice as you look at the psalm, there's really no heading in there. There's no subscription at the, underneath the psalm heading, Psalm 146. There's no author given. There's no date given. We don't have any circumstances. And, uh, and so we don't know who wrote this. We don't know why it was written. But certainly you'll find how helpful it is. The, the psalmist brought, gave us this psalm. And as we look at this psalm, as we said, there's the, the theme of trusting God and the theme of praising God. And we'll see how those two together. There's also the repetition, and I think this is important, of the divine name Yahweh, which emphasizes God's covenant-keeping nature, the fact that God is faithful to his promises, that he's the great I am, the eternal one, the self-existent God. And in verse 6, picks up on this again and mentions his faithfulness and how he keeps faith forever, faith forever. And I think that's important because the psalmist wants to encourage our trust, and it's important for us to know how faithful God is in caring for his people for us to trust him. And so we're going to sum all of this psalm up in one, set, one, ver- one uh, sentence here, and it's this. The psalmist calls us to worship and praise Yahweh for his faithfulness to encourage us to trust in him rather than men. Let me repeat that for you. The psalmist calls us to worship and praise Yahweh for his faithfulness to encourage us to trust in him rather than men. And we're going to look... Divide the, we're going to look at this psalm into three sections. 
Uh, We're going to see in verses 1 to 2, we're going to see the commitment to praise. In verses 3 and 4, we're going to see the caution of misplaced trust. And in verses 5 to 10, we're going to see the contentment of trusting, that is, trusting in God. So we're going to see the commitment to praise, the caution of misplaced trust, and the contentment of trusting in God. So first, we're going to see the commitment to praise, verses 1 to 2. Read along with me there. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And so the author begins the psalm by expressing his commitment to worship Yahweh. And as he does this, he gives us really three truths that help us understand worship as we enter this section, which is all about worship. First of all, worship is a joyful commitment. The word hallelujah there, which means praise Yah, which is a shortened verb, a shortened form of the word Yahweh, praise Yahweh, means, has the idea there of of a loud, enthusiastic, joyful praises. He's saying praise Yahweh enthusiastically. Praise our God with with joy, with, with gusto, with passion. And he's, actually, the word here is in the plural. So he's really calling, this is not a call just uh, to a friend over here. He's calling the whole corporate community, all of God's people, to join him in praising God with passion and joy. As I said, it's a, it's a, it's a command, it's a call that all people must heed. At the same time, you can't expect, this is, worship isn't to be just a dry and boring duty. It's not just something you have to do. Worship is something we get to do, something that should be full of joy and passion. Why? Because we love our God. We see how great he is. We see how awesome he is. And we love to praise him. We love to talk about him. Just like a, a man who is in love wants to talk about his lady. And so it should be with, our God, with us about our God. We should love him and therefore Delight to praise him. Second thing we learn here is worship is to be a lifelong commitment. Notice what the psalmist says there in verses two. In verse two there. I will praise Yahweh while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. So it's, I will do this. I will praise him while I live, as long as I live. And I will sing praises to While I have my being, which is really the same idea there, as long as I'm alive, as long as I'm on this earth, as long as I have breath, I will be praising God. And I think this is important for us to consider, that there needs to be a lifelong commitment to praise God. You know, it's easy for us to to start well in the Christian life. We're saved and we're excited, we're we want to tell everybody we're, we're filled with joy and excitement over the forgiveness and grace that God gives us. But as time goes on, it can have a, a hardening effect upon our hearts. We can go cold and dull in our devotion to God. And, and we, we have a, it's really hard to finish the Christian life well, to continue on in earnest worship and praise to God the whole of our life. And so we, we often get cold and wearied in our praise to God the longer we live. And this shouldn't be. Our God is great. Our God doesn't change. The problem is in us. And uh, we need to grow in our worship. We need to continue on worshiping God with passion, with gusto. Mature, really, the increase in fervent worship is a sign of maturity. It's a sign we're growing in faith. We're a sign we're growing in the knowledge of the truth. Steve Lawson says this, a growing Christian is one who is growing in fervency in his praise of God. When Jesus Christ is genuinely loved, there will be a growing surge of adoring praise. And so I would say to you, our prayer should be, may our loudest praises, may our most passionate praises be when our voices are, are, loud, are old and crackly, When we are old, may 
we have this even a growing, a greater passion than when we were young Christians. The third thing the psalmist wants to communicate to us about worship is that worship is a firm commitment. Notice what he says there, just even in the tense of the verb, I will sing praises to my God. I will praise Yahweh. There are no, commit, uh, there are no conditions to his commitment to praise, is there? He doesn't say, I will do this if it's, everything's good in my life. He says, I will do this. And whether there's storms in his life, whether there's difficulties in his life, whether there, it's darkness or light, that doesn't change his commitment to worship his God. He has a firm resolve here to worship his God no matter what the conditions are. And you, we all, all of us, need this kind of commitment because I can guarantee it. There are going to be times in your life and in my life where things are difficult and you may not feel like praising God. You may not feel like worshiping God, but you must resolve by faith that you will worship God no matter what the circumstances are. God does not change and you must be committed to worshiping him. Even like Job did, who suffered so much and yet he still continued to, to worship God. As you thought of, as I've explained what this passage is, means here, as you've seen the, the, the author's commitment to worship, that begs the question, what about you? Do you have the same commitment to worship like this psalmist does? Do you praise God? Do you worship God like this psalmist does? Because if you do have this commitment, it has a great benefit for your walk with God. It will strengthen your faith. It will fortify your trust in, in our God. And so the psalmist here switches gears as he goes into our next section here and warns us not to put our trust in men. And so we see the caution of misplaced trust. Verse three there. Do not trust in princes, in mortal men in whom there is no salvation. We are not to put our trust in princes or nobles. The word princes here has to the idea of somebody who's influential. Maybe they're powerful, they're wealthy, they have a great deal of influence in the, the society. And that wealth, that power, that influence, is, that's what we gravitate to. That, that's what we hold on to when we trust them for, for what we want. And then the next line broadens it out to not just include nobles and princes and the movers and shakers of this world, but to include all people. All people are included in this, as it mentions, in mortal men. And why should you not put your trust in mortal men? Why should you not put your trust in princes? Well, the next line explains that to you. There is no salvation in them. And I think it's important for us to remember that the word salvation means more than just salvation from, from hell, salvation from sin. Salvation in the Psalms, especially the, and, and even broadly in the Old Testament, has a broader meaning than that. It could refer to victory in battle or a deliverance from some difficulty, or salvation from sin as well. <clears throat> and so what the psalmist is saying, don't put your trust in men because they can't truly help you. They can't truly save you. They're like leaning on a rotten stick, which gives way once you put your hope and trust in them. They're, it's like building on sand. And you may be asking yourself, what well, does this mean I just never trust anybody anymore in the sense that I'm suspicious of everybody, I doubt everybody, I, I have a cynicism towards other people, I just never rely on them at all, I never believe anything they say or anything that they want to do. No, this isn't something like that. This is a warning not to trust people for what only God can provide. We are not to put our trust ultimately in people. We are not to make people our idols. And we do this when we trust people to do what only our God can do. You know, Israel had this problem often. <clears throat> Israel was looking to, for protection from other enemies. She was looking for security. She was looking for prosperity. And so what did she do? Well, did she pray to her God and seek him for all these things? No, nope. oftentimes she didn't do that. What did they do? Well, they turned to this king or that nation. 
uh, the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and she turned to them to seek in them um, these kind of things. And uh, one text among many, there's many texts that condemn Israel for this, is Isaiah 31. And the first couple verses there, it says this, God is speaking to Israel, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Instead of seeking the Lord for their protection, they went down to Egypt to trust in Egypt's armies. And we have a tendency to do that as well. We have a tendency, all of us here, you have a tendency to seek in people what only God can give. Here are a number of examples of which they're just only some, a sample of examples of how we can put our trust in other people. How about when we get married? So oftentimes when people get married, they're looking to their their spouse and we go, you know, this person, if I just get married to this person, this person is going to make me so happy. This person is going to make me fulfill. This person is going to make me so content and joyful and my whole life will be just so much better because I got married to this person. And that doesn't always happen because people are weak and sinful and uh, people make bad idols. And when that disappointment creeps in, then you're like, well, you know, then you have difficulties in marriage. And what about politics and politicians? How many of you today have been disappointed by a politician in the last number of years? Or maybe your whole life? Is there any politician that hasn't disappointed you? I think we all understand that politicians are very disappointing. And yet there's such a pull, such a temptation for us to to put our hope and trust in politicians to fix things. The power of the government is great. It's one of the biggest, the most powerful institutions that God has created. And so it's easy for us to look to the government, to look to a a certain politician to, to fix things that are wrong. Whether it's in your life or in the life of the country, we, we, wanna, we think, well, they can do it. They can fix it. <clears throat> but see, the problems of our country isn't the problem of our individual lives and the problem that we see in our country isn't something that's wrong with politics. The problem that's in our country is not a political problem primarily. The problem we have in our country is a spiritual problem. And politicians can't fix that. They never can. Politicians can't give spiritual life to people. They can't save people. They can't bring heaven down to earth. They can't bring utopia to this country. They can't bring in the kingdom by their policies. <clears throat> they can't secure the future for you. They can't make you rich and prosperous, ultimately. And they certainly can't make you content and joyful. And let's move to one more person, one more example of someone you shouldn't trust. And that's self. That's you. And how often don't we seek to look to ourselves for strength for our problems, difficulties. When we find ourselves in a difficult situation, how often are we praying about it or we just do it ourselves and we think, I can do this. I'm wise enough. I'm strong enough. I'm knowledgeable enough. I can do this instead of living in total dependence on God. Oftentimes, we become our greatest idol. And there's so many ways that we could apply this this prohibition here of trusting in man. And I've only given three examples, but I'm sure if you think about your life, you can find more examples of how you trust in people rather than in God. So I ask you that. Where are you guilty of trusting in man? Where in your life is there an idol that you need to remove from your, its throne? <clears throat> now I want to see something here that's important. 
Because we began this uh, psalm talking about praise and worship, and we said that really the problem for our lack of trust in God and our, our failure to trust in, our, in Him is, is related to praise. So how are those connected? How is praise and trust then rela- related? How is praise the remedy for our lack of trust in our God and our, our tendency towards to trust other people? Doesn't it seem odd that the, the psalmist goes from let's praise God to then don't trust in people? Well, the, here, here is the reason why he does this. Because what we value, what we praise, is what we tend to trust. And because we often praise men more than God, we put our trust in men rather than in God. Our faith is weak, and we don't often, we don't see the glory of God as well as we like, as well as we should. God is invisible. He sometimes seems distant from all that goes on around us. And then when we see people there, we can see them, we can touch them, we, we know they're there, and they seem strong, they seem wise, they seem able to help us. And so we, we tend to, to trust them. We tend to look to them first before we go to our God. We tend to see people as, as giants, and we see our God as a dwarf. And so we have that tendency to trust in people. Well, the psalmist wants to change that. He wants to to tell you today through this psalm that man is really the dwarf. Man is weak. Man is undependable. But God is great and trustworthy. He wants us to see how the praiseworthiness of God, the awesomeness of our God, so that we will learn to trust him rather than man. He wants us to praise God so that we trust him because praise is the solution to our lack of trust. And so in verse four, the psalmist begins to teach us, to remind us why it is so foolish to trust in men. In verse four there, it says, his spirit departs, he returns to the earth In that very day, his thoughts perish. Man will die. Man is a dying creature. That's why you shouldn't trust him. His spirit departs. He returns to the earth. He returns to the earth. There's actually an allusion to Genesis 3, verse 19. There, after the fall into sin, God cursed Adam and Eve and all those who came after them. And then God said this to Adam, Till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The psalmist is referencing that passage. And that there's a word play also in this section, because the word for man in verse 3 and the word for earth in verse 4 are very similar. And the psalmist is trying to emphasize that man, that people are very earthly creatures. They eventually turn back to the earth. They were made from the earth, and they eventually go back to the earth. Man's spirit departs from his body and rises up to... But his body returns back to dust from which God made it. You need to remember this about the people that you see around you. You remember remember this before you trust in them whether they're great people, powerful people, whether they're poor people, whether they're middle-class people, all people are weak and poor and eventually will return to dust. Eventually, all of us, all that will remain of us is just a pile of dust. You know, after World War II, the Allies had trials for the Nazi leaders. 1946, they're called the Nuremberg Trials. And all the Nazi leaders were, were there, tried, and uh, 14 of those leaders were then convicted, they were executed, and their, their bodies were cremated. And then the U.S. Army took all those ashes, and they carried them, took them, and went to a secret place. They took those ashes on a very drizzly night. They just dumped them in a ditch. And think about it for a moment there. These men 
were dictators with unlimited power. They could do anything they want in, the, in those in four or five years, in all those years that they were in power, especially during the war. They could do whatever they wanted, unlimited power. Men tremble before these people. And then it doesn't take a long time, and they're just a pile of dust, drifting away in a ditch somewhere. Is this the kind of person? This is what we all eventually return to. Is that who you want to trust? It's foolish for us to trust in such a weak creature. We also see from here that man is, man's mortality reminds he's, he's limited. And you can see that in the second part of verse 4. In that very day, in the day that man perishes, the, main, the, the, the day that man dies, his thoughts perish. What does it mean his thoughts perish? Well, his thoughts here have the idea of his, his plans, his ideas, his goals. When man dies, all of those things disappear. They're gone. They're like a, like a dream that suddenly ends. Like smoke in the dark that simply vanishes away. Man is limited. You think uh, there's so many people in the world who have had great plans to do great things and death comes and everything's gone and done. You think of Alexander the Great. He had conquered much of the known world and yet he still had plans to conquer more nations and, and yet he uh, brought himself to an early grave and everything disappeared and his kingdom was gone. The generals divided it up and it was rent asunder in different divisions. This is, the, this is man, this is people, this is who we are. This is the creature we so often trust to give us what we want. This sinful, weak, helpless, dying creature is the idol we often praise and the idol we often trust. Isn't that foolish? The psalmist says it is. God sees it as foolishness. You know, James Roscup has a helpful quote here. If we trust in men, we will get what men can do. But if we trust in God, we will get what God can do. And so in this section, we've seen what man can do, which isn't a whole lot. But now we're, let's shift gears here and consider what can God do? And that's a whole lot. So we see third, in the third point here, the contentment of trusting. Verse five there, how blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. You know, trusting in a man ends in disappointment and sorrow. But how different it is for those who trust in God. Certainly, you have, hopefully, you have found it so. Notice the word how blessed there. The word bless is in the plural, which is, could be translated, oh, the blessednesses, which isn't proper English, but that's okay. It gets the idea across. There's a multitude of joy. Uh, there is great peace. There's great contentment. There's great happiness for those who will make God uh, the, the object of their trust. When trusting in Yahweh is the ruling principle of your life, you will have joy. You will have contentment. You will have peace. And our psalmist here says, he is our help and our hope. Notice that in that section there, verse four, 5. It talks about how blessed is he whose help. And then it says, whose hope. And help refers to God's help that he gives in the present. And hope has an idea towards the, the future, that we we're trusting in God for the future. He talks about how, whose help is the God of Jacob. And the God of Jacob there refers to the, the God of Israel, the God of God's covenant people, the God who, whose forefather was Jacob, the, the wandering and often erring and deceitful man. And yet God was faithful to him, just as he was faithful to Israel. And so that's a reference to the corporate people of God. 
And then in, in verse 5, at the, the second part, whose hope is in Yahweh, his God, is more personal. And so whether it's for the whole people of God or whether it's just for you individually, each will find that it, there is a great blessedness in trusting in Yahweh, in trusting in God. So why should you trust in God? How, why should you be turning away from the trust of man? Well, in the next section, verses 6 to 10, it gives us the answer. And in this section, we see in, in rapid fire, we see all things that God can do. And here in this section, as we consider what God, who, what, who God is and what God can do, we see praise and trust being blended together. For as we look at this section, as we look, consider all of these things, this section gives us reasons why we should trust God, why God is trustworthy, why we should put our hope in him so that we can learn to trust him. But on the other hand, as we consider the trustworthiness of God, it gives us cause to praise him. And as we, just in a general comment about these, this section here, what God does and what God gives, as we see in, as we'll go through these verses, these are things we often look for in other people. And the psalmist's point is, these things are not found in people. People can't do that. They're found in our God. And so there's really 11 actions, 11 deeds that, God, that the psalmist lists to encourage our faith and to help us to praise God. And so we'll look at those, and we'll go through them quite rapidly there. But first of all, Yahweh is the creator. Notice what it says there, verse 6, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. God is our creator. God is the creator. And man is simply a creature. God made him out of the dust of the earth. But God made everything. God made all the stars. He made all the galaxies. He made all the planets simply by speaking without any effort on his part. He created the whole earth. He created the dry lands. He created the vast seas. He, he created the animals. He created the birds. He created the beasts of the field. He created all the insects. All of those are created by our God simply by speaking. And all of that creation reminds us that God is infinite in power. He is infinite in wisdom. There, this is a great God, a big God, an awesome God. And that is a reason why you can trust him. You can trust him because he is the creator of heaven and earth. And he created you as well and knows you perfectly. He is worthy of your trust and can be depended on. Second thing there you see is Yahweh is faithful. He keeps faith forever, it says. Or it could be he preserves or guards faithfulness. Yahweh is faithful to you. He is faithful to his people. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his own character. He's faithful to those he loves. He's faithful to his covenants. He has never lied. He's never broken a promise. Since the world's began, God has never, ever been found unfaithful. If you think of all the time that's gone by in, in this world, the thousands of years of history that we can study and look at, think of all those people who have lived there. Not one of them could ever say God has been unfaithful, that God has broken his promise, that God has ever lied. None of them. And if you should go to heaven and interview the people in heaven, could any of them tell you, that God has ever let them down throughout their whole life, all the years that they lived, did God ever lie to them? Did God ever disappoint them? And each one of them could say, no, he has never disappointed me. He's always been faithful. With a perfect track record of faithfulness that God has, you can trust him too in all your circumstances. Even when you don't understand why he does what he does, you can trust that he, is ne he will never lie to you. He will never forsake you. He will hold fast to you. He has a perfect track record, 100% faithfulness. And that's not going to change any time in the future. Yahweh is also the one who gives justice. He who, no, verse 7 there, who executes justice for the oppressed. 
If you look in human history and you look at our time here, you see so much injustice. You see human judges and rulers who fail to give justice. In fact, it seems that injustice is rather the norm. And even when human judges give justice, it's rather imperfect. But not our God. Yahweh is just. All the wrongs of human history will be dealt by him. Perfect justice will be done on the day of judgment. Everyone will receive what they deserve. And you can trust that he will execute justice perfectly. He will never fail to give everyone what they deserve. The fourth thing we see is Yahweh provides food. Who gives food to the hungry. Well, there's plenty of examples in Scripture where Yahweh has given food to his people. Not just by ordinary means, but sometimes even by extraordinary means. Think of the time in the wilderness. There's no food in the wilderness usually. And yet God sustained his people, millions of people, for 40 years, every day providing them his food. You can trust God to provide for you. Fifth, Yahweh grants freedom. Notice what it says there. Yahweh sets the prisoners free. In fact, Yahweh can set a whole nation free who are prisoners. If you think of the Exodus and how God led his people out of Exodus, out of slavery, he gave them freedom. And it's not just, I think, maybe thinking of a a physical kind of uh, freedom here, but really a spiritual freedom. God can give spiritual freedom from sin. From bondage to sin, God can give freedom. No one else can. Six, God provides sight. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. No one can cure the blind, whether that's in the physical sense or whether that's in the spiritual sense. There's not a person in this world who can cure the blind, but Yahweh can, God can. God can do those things, no one else can. Yahweh gives comfort and strength. Notice the next part there. The Lord, Yahweh raises up those who are bowed down. And there's many reasons why we can be bowed down. Maybe you are bowed down today. But in every case, God can give you comfort and strength and peace within your troubled soul. And only he can apply it directly into your hearts. He, only he can give, give the balm that cures your hurting heart. It's found in Yahweh, in our God. Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this, he consoles the bereaved, he cheers the defeated, he solaces the despondent and comforts the despairing. The eighth thing is Yahweh loves his people. The Lord, it says, loves the righteous. The righteous here are not those who are just good people. The righteous here refers to those who have been like Abraham, justified by faith. They have put their hope and trust for their salvation, not in themselves, not in their righteousness, not in their deeds that they do, but they have put their hope and their faith and their trust in God to declare them righteous. And God loves his people that he has redeemed. He loves his people whom he has justified. He seeks to do them good all the time. He works to always do what's best for his people. God's God's heart overflows with an infinite love for those whom he has redeemed. And if he loves us so much, certainly we can trust him to take care of us. In fact, I would say as you look at all of these different things that God does, really love, his love for his people is the reason why he does all these things. Because he loves them and he cares for them. The ninth thing that we see here is that Yahweh protects the weak. The Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow. The strangers, the orphans, the widows were and are still weak and vulnerable, often neglected by society, often put to the outside. But it says here that our God cares for them. 
Our God protects them. Our God has a special love for them. He provides for them. He defends them when nobody else will. You know, one of the interesting things we see in all these actions of God, and maybe you're tracking with me here, and maybe you're starting to see it too, but as we look at so many of these, doesn't this remind you of our Lord Jesus Christ's ministry on earth and how he opened the eyes of the blind, how he set those who were spiritually in bondage free, how he healed people, how he cared for the orphan and stranger? Even as we put this psalm and we put it by the Gospels, it should just show to us that our Lord is indeed divine. It's this passage, Psalm 146, is a proof of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The tenth thing we see there is Yahweh ruins the wicked. Notice what it says there. But he thwarts the way of the wicked. This is in contrast, isn't there? The word but there has a, there's a contrast here. A contrast to the fact that he loves the righteous. He cares for them. But on the contrast, the wicked, he thwarts their way. The, the wicked will find their schemes, their plans, their evil actions to be futile. The word thwart here has the idea of to frustrate, to make crooked, to bend. To, to divert their intentions away from their goals. Kind of reminds you of Psalm 1 again, right? Psalm 1 stands at the very head of the Psalter, and it's, it, ha- it really sets the tone for the entire book. But Psalm 1, verse 6 says, But the way of the wicked will perish. Here we see the way of the wicked will be thwarted. And really, here's another reason why we can trust our God, isn't there? We can trust him because in the midst of an evil world, midst of oppression, all those schemes and the plans of the wicked, they're under the control of God. God eventually will thwart all their plans and bring them to nothing. God has to but speak And all the lifetime of labor, all the careful planning of the wicked falls in a crumbling heap and nothing remains of it. And so this is comfort for you who have put your hope and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is even in control of all the wicked actions of people around you. But I think there's also something here for those who are unconverted. And if there's any here who have never put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, there is a warning here. Eventually, your idols will let you down. Eventually, God will oppose you. Eventually, you'll have to answer for the wrongs that you have done. You cannot continue in rebellion forever. God will thwart your way and bring justice and judgment to you. And so today, I urge you today to repent, to turn away from trusting in yourself, trusting in your own righteousness, trusting in your own works, and put your faith and your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Renounce self and turn yourself wholeheartedly to our Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus Christ. Look to him to find forgiveness. Look to him to find righteousness. For he loves to forgive. He loves to cleanse the sinner. He loves to give his righteousness to that sinner, to declare them righteous in the sight of his God. So turn from your sins. Repent of your right wickedness and, and come to Jesus and find in him repentance, forgiveness, mercy. The last thing we see here is Yahweh as an eternal king. Verse 10. Yahweh will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Our God sits on his throne forever. Our God is sovereign over all that goes on. And that doesn't change tomorrow. That doesn't change in a 100 years. He is king forever over the whole universe. God will not die. God will not abdicate his throne. God will not be toppled by his throne. There are no coups 
that can take God off his throne. He remains forever as king. He is sovereign over all things. Isn't that a reason why you and I can trust him? Isn't that a reason why we can rest so confidently in him? There will never be a time when he is not there to care for us. He will never, there will never be a time when this world will get out of control. Everything is under his sovereign care. And this also helps us as we call the next generation to trust in the Lord. God is unchanging in his faithfulness. Your children can put their faith and trust in God and find him completely reliable as you have found him. The next, the, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren can all come to him and find that he is completely faithful. He will never desert them, never disappoint them. Every generation that trusts in our God will find him a very present help in trouble. And so you see the ending of the psalm begins with praise the Lord and praise Yah. Praise Yah. So we began this sermon with asking, well, what do we do when we have trust issues? What do we do when we struggle in our faith to trust God? How do we learn to trust God more? What do we do when we're tempted to trust in other people? And we said the answer to that is what? Praising God, worshiping God. And so when you're tempted to trust in other people, when you're tempted to, to, to waver in your trust of God, what do you do? Praise him. Remember who he is. Call to mind all that he's done. Call to mind his great character. And then walk by faith, trusting him, praising him along the way. That's one reason why it's so important to be here on Sunday. That's why it's, we take such great care, why Joe and, and the music, musicians take such great care in the songs that we sing. Because those songs have an important part in your daily walk with God. Because as you sing good theology, as you sing about your God, it helps you to trust him throughout the week. Our God is the only one that you can, can unconditionally depend upon. What God promises, he makes good. People will let you down. Your spouse will let you down. Your children will disappoint you. Politicians will let you down. Your friends will fail you. You will find that you yourself are often helpless, often weak, unable to do anything for yourself. But I want you to consider Yahweh. I want you to consider our God, how awesome, how great, how glorious he is. I want you to put your trust in him. He is faithful. You will not be disappointed. Let's pray. What can we do, Lord, but praise you? You've never disappointed us. You've never failed us. We thank you, Lord, for that. Pray that you'd increase our faith, help us to trust you, and help us as we sing to, to praise you with renewed vigor and joy. We pray this in our Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen.